Well, if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and grab them now. We're going to get into the Word now. So go ahead and grab your Bibles however you have them. Hopefully uh, you have it somehow, whether it's on the smartphone or the tablet or a physical Bible. Just get out the Word of God. And turn with me to the Gospel of John. For those of you who are just joining us, because I know Easter Sunday, we tend to have a lot of guests or people who we haven't seen in a while. We welcome you, and uh, just to let you know, we have been working our way through the Gospel of John for over two years now, (laughs) two years with some breaks here and there, Uh, but we are finally coming close to the end, okay? Lord willing, uh, we will actually be finishing this book uh, over the next couple of weeks, okay? Over the next couple of weeks, finish the Gospel of John, and today on Easter Sunday, appropriately, we come to the resurrection passage, Okay, and so our text for today is John chapter 19, John chapter 19, and we will be reading from verse 38 and finishing in verse 18 of chapter 20, okay? And so we're going to actually close out the last part of chapter 19, which covers Jesus' burial. We didn't cover that last week, but we are going to read it today. And just FYI, I'm not actually going to be touching upon those verses. Um, We're just going to kind of read them for context Uh, Because I want to spend today covering the first part of chapter 20, which of course covers the resurrection, okay? And so John chapter 19, uh, verse 38 to chapter 20, verse 18 is our text for today, right? Does anybody need a minute uh, to find it? If you do, please say, wait. All right, I gave you the chance, all right? So here we go. Uh, Trusting that everybody is there, let's uh, hear now the word of God, okay? Okay. Starting from verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. 
Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God. Let's pray together uh, before we dive in. Father, thank you so much again for your wonderful work of redemption that you accomplished through your son, Jesus Christ, who took the place of sinners, who absorbed your wrath for all of our sins so that we, by faith in Christ, could live and we thank you so much for this day which we remember that truly our sins have been paid for truly it is finished jesus christ has won he has defeated death and that makes all the difference that is why we are here today and so we give you praise and honor and we pray that as we do uh, focus our attention in a special way on the resurrection of jesus just that lord your holy spirit would speak to us you give us ears to hear give us eyes to see give us hearts to worship and love jesus christ that is what we desire at the end of all of this that we would love christ more and more and so do this for your glory and for our joy in jesus name we pray amen Now, as much as I love celebrating this all-important and all-significant event of Jesus' resurrection every single year on Easter Sunday, as much as I love it, and I do, there's always a challenge when preaching on this because the reality is, as Christians, we pretty much celebrate this every week. Right? Every single week. In fact, if you didn't know, uh, the reason that we gather on Sunday, when in fact uh, Saturday is actually the Sabbath day, okay? Hopefully you knew that. But the reason that we worship on Sunday is because Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday, okay? And so really our gathering on Sunday as Christians every single week, it is really a celebration. It's really a remembrance that Jesus rose from the dead. Okay? And of course, not only do we celebrate and remember this every single week, but the reality is that we live in light of this every single day. Right? The resurrection pretty much shapes our entire lives. It is everything to us who believe. And so because of this, because of this reality, there can be a challenge at times uh, when preaching on Jesus' resurrection because it is so familiar to us. It is so normal to us. We talk about it all the time. We celebrate it all the time. We live in light of it all the time. And so there's sort of a challenge uh, for me personally, maybe, maybe not for others, but for me, whenever we preach on the resurrection. And so today, uh, I am not going to try to say anything new or anything clever when it comes to the resurrection. And I'm sorry if that disappoints. Sorry if you came here like, I hope he's going to say something new. Uh, there's nothing new to say, right? Jesus rose from the dead, right? So I'm not going to try to do that. However, however... I do think that there are some very interesting, very peculiar things in this passage that maybe you have not thought about before that when you read it should make you think, hmm, that's a little weird. (laughs) Why is that there? Or, Or what does that mean? Why does John mention that, these little details? Okay, and maybe as we're reading it, some of you are asking that question. Good, okay? And so that's really what I want to focus specifically on today, okay? Today, I want to look at this account of the resurrection by the Apostle John, and I want to focus on some things that seem to be a little bit odd, seems a little bit strange, okay? And and there are probably several things, okay? I'm not going to answer all the questions that you might have. You're like, why is that there? Probably won't be able to answer everything, but I want to focus on just three things, okay? Three things, And so three strange and peculiar things that John seems to mention about the resurrection in this account, okay? And the first one begins in the very first verse of chapter 20, okay? This will sort of set the scene for us, okay? So if you look at verse 1, it says, Now on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark, saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And so what does she do? Verse 2, she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, who I've mentioned before is almost certainly the author of this book, okay? The Apostle John himself, he always refers to himself that way. So Mary, she runs to Peter and the Apostle John, and it says she said to them, 
They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And by the way, uh, the reason Mary says we, okay, it's just Mary here according to John, but she says we don't know where they are is actually because in the other Gospels, it tells us that Mary wasn't actually alone. There were actually other women with her, okay? But John doesn't mention that, but other Gospels tell us Mary is not alone. And, and we probably assume that because most of the time women didn't work, uh, walk in the middle of the night, you know, like scary and dangerous to a tomb. And so she's there with other women. And so Mary tells Peter and John about this empty tomb. And then listen to what happens in verse 3 and 4. Okay, this is where we get to this kind of strange detail. Verse 3, it says, So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. And then verse 4. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. This is really strange, right? Like, I read that, I'm like, what? Why is he mentioning this? Like, seriously, why in this description of really the most significant event in history, this is the most significant event, why do we need to know that John, who is writing this, outran Peter and got to the tomb first. <laughs> like, it seems like a really insignificant and, and really comical remark, right? Like, is, is, is John just bragging here, right? Is he sort of just bragging here? Is he trying to let everybody know that, you know, he beat good old Peter the slowpoke to the tomb? You know, ha, 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 Peter. <laughs> I just want to make that very clear for history that I got to the tomb first. Is that what he's doing? Like, why in the world does he even bother to mention this? Well, there's a few explanations that commentators give for this, but the simplest, and I believe the best explanation, is that John gives this description of him outrunning Peter to the tomb because it really happened. It really happened. In other words, this is one of those details that, once again, John includes. We've talked about this before. He includes these specific details all throughout his gospel. This is another example where he he does this in order to show us this is his eyewitness testimony. Like, this is exactly what happened. Because, if you think about it, these are not the sort of details that people give if they're making up a story. If they're making up a story, if John was making this whole thing up, there's no reason for him to tell us that he outrounded Peter to the tomb. No reason at all, because what does that have to do with the story? What does that have to do with the main point that Jesus is alive, the tomb is empty? Why does he have to mention, oh, by the way, uh, I, I got to the tomb first? doesn't add anything to the main point, right? And so the only reason that John would include this kind of detail is to tell us this really happened. This is exactly how it happened. That he was there with Peter and that they both raced to the tomb to see what was going on. This is eyewitness testimony. And what this, of course, should tell us, to bring an implication for us, what this should tell us is that the tomb of Jesus was really empty. And of course, it still is. In fact, did you know that out of all the historical narratives regarding the aftermath of Jesus' death, in in other words, what happened to Jesus after he died, okay, all the historical narratives, almost nobody doubts the empty tomb. Nobody, okay? In other words, nearly all serious historians, we're not talking about people on TikTok who are like, did you know about this, and they didn't do any research, okay? Serious historians who study this stuff, All of them, Christian or not, we're not just even talking about Christian people, Christian or not, serious historians, they all agree the tomb was empty because the evidence is just too strong. That tomb of Jesus, it was empty. And there are many reasons that these scholars and historians agree on this, but one of them is simply this. This is one of those reasons that they they all agree, and it's very simple. Where's the body? (laughs) They could not locate the body of Jesus Christ, right? And from the very beginning, we're not talking about 30, 40, 50 years later. From the very beginning, just days after Jesus was crucified and buried, this is the immediate report going out. The body's gone. The tomb is 
empty. And then suddenly news starts to spread like wildfire that people had actually seen the risen Jesus Christ. Now you think about that, right? Right from the very beginning. Everybody knows Jesus died. He was crucified. He was buried. People even know where that tomb is. And then suddenly people are spreading this news. The tomb is empty. What would you have to do to crush that report right away? Just find the body, right? Just have the body show up. He's right there. Here's the body. Obviously, he did not rise from the dead. Find the body. You find the body of Jesus Christ, there's no Christianity. Okay? There's no Christianity. But they could not find the body. Not back then, not right now. Right? Nobody can find this body. And so nobody doubts that the tomb was empty. Nobody. Okay? However, of course, the question of what exactly happened to the body of Jesus Christ. That, of course, is a whole other story, okay? What exactly happened to Jesus' body? All kinds of theories about what happened to Jesus' body. And the most common one, okay, the most common one to this day, the disciples stole the body, okay? They stole the body. In fact, if you look at Matthew's account, we're actually told that when the chief priest, the one who put Jesus to death, when they heard that the tomb of Jesus was empty, it says that they actually paid money to the soldiers who were reporting this to them to tell everyone that his disciples came by night and they stole the body. And this is the story, Matthew says, that has been spreading among the Jews all the way up until today, okay, in, in Matthew's day at least, okay? And so the most common theory to what happened to Jesus' body is that the disciples stole it, they took the body and they ran and they hid. Now, let me just say, there are um, several arguments that can, can be made that have been made to show why this is actually a ridiculous theory to believe, okay? And if you are not familiar with those, I would highly recommend that you just do your own research. You, you know, maybe you can just even type online, like, why the body of Jesus could not have been stolen by his disciples. You'll, you'll probably get all this good stuff there, okay? I would I encourage you to look it up for yourself, but today I just want to point out what John highlights, because John highlights something. John highlights something as evidence to discredit that theory that Jesus' body was stolen. And this actually leads us to the second strange detail that John highlights in this passage. And it's in verse 7. Verse 7, where John mentions this face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head not lying with a linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Now, you read that, and you should be thinking, what in the world is John doing here? That is a weird detail, right? Another one of these strange details. Why is he mentioning this? Okay. Well, clearly it's very significant. Very, very, very significant because in verse 8, we read that when the disciple, he's uh, talking about himself, who had reached the tomb first, went in, he saw and believed. In other words, something about seeing this face cloth all wrapped up made John believe. Now, evidently, uh, we know John didn't understand everything at this point. It's not like he saw this face cloth and suddenly he's like, yep, Jesus resurrected from the dead, our sins are forgiven, all this theology. No. Obviously, he didn't understand everything because in verse 9 it says very clearly, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead, okay? So in other words, seeing this face cloth, again, didn't give John like a full grasp of the resurrection at this point. But certainly, certainly it gave him enough to believe that something other than Jesus' body being stolen happened here. Something other. Because that, that's really the first thing that would have went through everybody's mind, Okay? The first thing that would have went through anybody's mind when you hear that the, the tomb of Jesus is empty is that somebody stole the body, okay? even the disciples. Okay? Uh, in case you didn't know, even though Jesus, he uh, repeatedly told his disciples that he would rise again after dying, right? he made it pretty clear to them, uh, nobody really expected that to happen. Okay? Nobody really believed that that would actually happen because otherwise they would have all been at the tomb here right, on the third day. You, you would think, Jesus said that he was going to rise on the third day. Let's go to the tomb. Let's go see, is it true? But they're not there, right? None of them are there, okay? Why? They didn't expect it. They didn't believe it. 
In fact, even Mary Magdalene, who is here at the tomb, got to give her some credit, she comes to the tomb. When she sees that the stone had been taken away, she runs to Peter and John, and what does she say? He's risen! <laughs> Can you believe it? It happened just as he said. You got to come and check it out. No, he doesn't say that, does he? Right? She doesn't say that. No, she says, they've taken away the Lord. They've taken him out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid him. Somebody has stolen the body. I'm being very dramatic, but, you know, she thinks somebody has stolen the body. And the reason that she thinks that is because in that day it was a normal thing, okay? If you didn't know that, apparently grave robbing was a real thing back then, okay? It really happened. In the Roman Empire, they had to actually impose rules and punishments for people who did that because it happened regularly where people would rob the grave. And, and this, of course, explains why the Jewish leaders, they resorted to this explanation for what happened to Jesus' body. Somebody stole it. Just spread that news because it is a reasonable explanation. It happens all the time. Okay. But the Apostle John here, so good, right, including these little details. He gives these little details here to stress the fact that this was no grave robbery. That is not what is going on here. Because first of all, there's the linen cloths mentioned in verse 5 and 6. And you just have to use your brain a little bit, okay? Why in the world would grave robbers unwrap a dead body before stealing it, right? Why would they do that? That just doesn't happen because not only would it take more time, but there's a dead corpse in there, right? It smells, why would you do that? You know, we're going to steal a body, but let's just unwrap him, check him out. You know, he's all beaten, bloody, and now let's steal it. You would not do that. But it happens here. And then, of course, there's the face cloth. And don't miss the fact that John mentions that it's all folded up in a place by itself. Like, what is that about? You should be asking that question. What is that face cloth all about? Like, did the grave robbers have, like, a special respect for this face cloth? Like, were, were they, they wanted to make sure, like, before we steal the body, let's, let's take off that fold. Hold on. Wrap it up nicely. Okay, good. Let's go now. Right? Is that what they're doing? Why are they doing this? It makes no sense that a face cloth covering up a dead body would just be, you know, folded up so nicely there. Makes no sense. But this is why when John sees this, he sees that folded up face cloth, he realizes this is not a grave robber. He's just using his logic. <laughs> this is unusual. This is like nothing we've ever seen before. Like, why would they do that? And then he concludes something else must have happened here. This is not a grave robbery. And so that's what these details are meant to tell us. It is not a grave robbery. But there's more. Okay, and this is where it gets good. There's actually much more. Because there is something much deeper that John is actually communicating to us through these details of the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth all neatly folded up. And it's something that the readers of the Gospel of John, which is all of us if you've been here, something that the readers of the Gospel of John should immediately pick up on. And it's this. In case you didn't pick up on it, let me tell you. This is what it is. It's that what's happening right here at Jesus' empty tomb, it is vastly different from what happened at another empty tomb. And in case you're wondering which one, we are talking about Lazarus. Back in John chapter 11. Okay. Because if you remember that story when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead by simply shouting, Lazarus, come out! Right? That's what he did. And then suddenly Lazarus comes out. John mentions in verse 44, you can read it for yourself, John chapter 11, verse 44, he mentions that Lazarus came out specifically with his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Same Greek word. In other words, when Lazarus came out of the grave, it was like this. Like a mummy, right? right? When we were there, I was kind of describing that. Literally coming out like a mummy, right? Must have been a terrifying sight. Right? All wrapped up, face there. And, right? Please help me. I don't know what he was saying, right? And then, he, of course, at the very end, he has his 
death clothes still on, and so Jesus has to say, unbind him. Let him go. And so you see the massive difference already, don't you? Massive difference. Yes, Lazarus, he was resurrected from the dead, but unfortunately he was still wrapped up in death. Still had death's clothing on. In other words, he would have to face death one more time. And every time I think about Lazarus now, I'm always like, man, poor Lazarus. Seriously. Like, dude has to die twice, right? Most, probably all of us, we face death once, okay? Unless a miracle happens and you get resurrected. But Lazarus, two times, right? Terrible. Still got his death clothes on. But what's happening to Jesus here, vastly different. Because Jesus' grave clothes, they are left behind. He puts them aside. And that face cloth, which really is a symbol of death, it's all nicely folded up, pretty much to tell us, I won't be needing this anymore. You can put that thing aside because I no longer need it. You know, these days, um, praise God, the weather is getting warmer. Right? Praise God. Amen. Anybody happy about that? A lot of winter people here, man. What's going on here, right? But the weather is getting warmer, right? And so that means uh, probably a lot of you, maybe some of you, um, have already started to kind of wash your winter clothes, right? Your winter blankets, you put them in the... You do do that, right? Hopefully you do that, right? You wash them, uh, and then what do you do after you wash them? You fold them up real nicely, and you put them away. Why? You don't need them anymore. Winter is over, baby, right? Hallelujah, right? You put them away, and in a similar way. Yet, of course, not so temporary because obviously Jesus, he's not just putting it away to put it back on later. No, in a similar yet not so temporary way, Jesus, by folding up this little face cloth, he's saying, I won't be needing this anymore. I don't need that. You can put this thing away because I have conquered death. Death no longer has a claim over me forever. There is no second death for Jesus. No. There's no return of winter, if you will, for Jesus. No, he has been raised never to die again. And the incredible implication for us, why we celebrate Easter Sunday, is that in him, if you believe in Jesus Christ, so will you. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 tells us Jesus, he is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, all who died in Christ will be raised again just as Christ has been raised again in glory with a new spiritual body resurrected to never ever taste death again. You can put that face cloth away. I do not need it anymore that is the hope of the resurrection brothers and sisters that is the hope that we possess because jesus lives amen that's our hope and that is what this strange mentioning of the folded up face cloth means now when you read that you know you look at that face cloth like yes right that's my story i don't need that thing anymore i'll have to put it on one time but after that put it away forever that's what it means Now, last thing, one more. The last strange detail that I want to mention in this passage is the way in which Jesus speaks to Mary in verse 17. Look at verse 17. Where Jesus says to Mary, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Now, this is also a little strange Because on the surface, it seems a bit harsh. It actually seems a little bit insensitive given what has just happened, okay? Because let me just read for us again the account of what just happened to Mary, okay? Starting in verse 11. Just follow along and and, and just read this for a little bit of context again, okay? Listen to this. It said, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. She is weeping. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head, one at the feet. And they said to her, women, why are you weeping? She said to him, they, them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing 
but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Now, when I read that, I really wondered what it would have sounded like when Jesus said, Mary. Like, was it, a, was it a soft, sort of gentle Mary? Or, or was it more like a, there was like a chuckle, <laughs> Mary, Mary, you know? Just like, or was it more harsh or like, like stern, Mary, you know? I really wonder, you know? And I'm not sure, there's no way that I could answer that question, but what I am sure of, okay? And I think this is what John is pointing at. What I am sure of is that what we are witnessing right here is that glorious truth of what Jesus said back in John chapter 10. You don't have to turn there, but that's the chapter where Jesus is talking about being the good shepherd. And he starts talking about how the sheep know the voice of their master. And he starts talking about how the master knows his sheep and calls them by name. Mary. All it took was for Jesus to call Mary by name, and she immediately recognized him. Immediately. And evidently what happened next was she ended up falling on her knees and worshiping Jesus. That's actually what Matthew's account tells us. It tells us that she, along with the other women who were there, right, because I mentioned there's other women, they fall down, they take hold of Jesus' feet because they've just heard their master's voice, and they start worshiping him. Now, right there, that sounds pretty good to me, right? Like, that sounds like exactly what should happen, like, praise the Lord, Jesus is going to be happy about this, they're worshiping him, they finally see him, but then we get verse 17, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. Actually, if you look up the King James Version, it's a lot stronger. He says, touch me not. <laughs> like, whoa, <laughs> right? Like, touch me not. You know, like, what the? They're like worshiping you, Jesus. What? You know? It's strange. It seems to be a bit harsh. Touch me not. <laughs> but notice the reason Jesus gives. Why should they not cling to him? I have not yet ascended to the Father. In other words, Jesus is saying, don't hold on to me, Mary, because I need to ascend to the Father. So he's not simply saying, don't touch me, okay, touch me now. He's not saying, like, don't touch me literally, but he means don't hold on to me as if you only want me to be here physically with you. Because clearly that is what is in Mary's heart, right? That's why after both the angels and Jesus ask Mary, why are you weeping, right? Two times, why are you weeping? She answers, they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where he is. Show me where he is, right? She's clearly focused just on Jesus' physical life, his physical body. I want the physical body. But Jesus wants Mary to understand. As he has said earlier in this book, it's actually better that he goes away. It's actually what he says, it's better for me to go away. It's actually better for me to ascend because then the Holy Spirit will come and be with you forever. And that means I can be with you always. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, every single place you go, wherever you travel, he is with you because the Holy Spirit has come Sometimes we always have that thought, like, oh, it would be so much better if Jesus were here. You really think that you would be able to see Jesus if he were here? Like, out of all the places he could be, you think that he would be here right now? Maybe. I hope so. But the chances of you actually seeing Jesus, if he did not ascend to the Father, very rare. How many of you have ever seen a president before, like, face to face? Oh, one hand. Bless you, brother. All right? But, but the point is, most of us have not seen even the president, right? And he's in this country. So we probably would not see Jesus if he were just in the flesh. So Jesus says, it's better that I go away so that I can be with you by my Holy Spirit everywhere. You don't have to go all the way to find me. I'm with you now and forevermore. And so Jesus, he says to Mary, don't cling to me. 
Don't just hold on to me. But instead, listen to this. And this is what I want to close with. He says, go to my brothers. Did you notice that? Go to my brothers. And that's very significant. Very significant because it's not often that Jesus speaks of his disciples, at least before the resurrection and death, as brothers. And it's even more significant that given all of his disciples have pretty much abandoned him, haven't they? All of them in the moment where Jesus was arrested, they fled. They ran away. And yet Jesus says, go tell my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, my God and your God. That's very significant. He's not just saying my father and my God. He says, but also your father, your God. Why? Because this was the promise that John made clear from the very beginning of his gospel. Very beginning, in chapter 1, verse 12, he said, But to all who did receive Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's why. You see, because Jesus died and rose from the dead and ascended to the Father, which completed his redemptive work on the cross, all of these three things are intricately linked. Okay, you can't have one without the other. Because he did all this, you and I are now in the family of God by faith. By faith in Christ, God is our Father. That's why we can actually say, our Father. He's my Father. And get this, not only is God your Father, Jesus Christ, though he is your Lord, though he is your Savior, though he is your master, he's also your brother. It's not wrong at all for you to call Jesus your brother, my brother. And isn't that unbelievable? Isn't that just unbelievable that Jesus calls us brothers and sisters? These are my brothers. These are my sisters. In Hebrews chapter 2, it, the author of Hebrews makes clear that Jesus, he is not ashamed to call us brothers, to call us sisters. And I don't know about you, but I find that to be very, very amazing. Very, very amazing. Because I can think of more than a thousand reasons why Jesus should be ashamed to call a person like me his brother. A person like me his brother. Because I have failed him more than a thousand times. I have sinned against him more than a thousand times. I have wronged him more than a thousand times. I've turned my back on him more than a thousand times. And if you're honest, so have you. All of us. But Hebrews chapter 2 tells us he is not ashamed to call us brothers because he suffered. He has died. He has bled for every single sin that could have caused him to be ashamed of us. Could have caused him to look at you and be like, ah, oh, that guy, my brother, ah, oh, that woman, my sister, I don't know about that. Every single thing that he could have looked at us and be like, shame. No, he died for it. And therefore, the author of Hebrews says he's not ashamed to call us brothers. You are his sister. You are his brother because you're in his family now. You belong to him. And the way that we know this is true, the absolute sure way we know this is true is because on the third day, he rose again. On that day, he rose again, which tells us the payment of sin has been accepted. Amen? It is truly finished. To tell us die, just in case you forgot, okay? To tell us die. It is finished. And now, Jesus, he has ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he now intercedes for us. He reigns forevermore until the last enemy, which is death, is put under his feet. And I hope that you know this and believe this because brothers and sisters, we know in this life we're going to suffer. Some of you are suffering right now. In this life we're going to experience pain. We're going to experience tragedy. We're going to experience death inevitably every single one of us. But one day, okay? One day we know that because Jesus Christ died and rose again, death will be no more. 
all of the tragedies, all the pain, all of the tears, they will be no more because Jesus defeated death. He's going to raise us anew with him forever and ever and ever, never to taste death again. And when we understand that, I mean, when we really believe and, and acknowledge that, the proper response really is just to say, hallelujah, right? What an amazing truth that death no longer has its claim over your life. Yes, we will die once, but never again. Father, what an amazing gift it is to live on this side of, the, of redemption. <laughs> I was just thinking yesterday, Lord, right after Good Friday service, I was just thinking about how those disciples must have felt on Saturday. How depressed, how sad, how maybe they felt like we, we just wasted three years of our life. All this heightened expectation but disappointment which for anybody who's experienced disappointment we know that's one of the worst things to experience <laughs> feeling disappointed but thank you lord that just like the sun rose this morning we will see the, the glory of the sun lord we know having lived on this other side of redemptive history seeing the finished work that jesus has risen that he's not dead he's no longer in the tomb but he has risen forevermore, never to die again. He reigns forevermore, seated at the right hand of God until make all the enemies are made under his foot as a footstool, that last enemy being death. And we long for that day, and we're so thankful that we can anticipate that day when death is no more because, Lord, it sucks being here and seeing so much death around us, so much pain, so much agony, so much suffering that Everybody in this room has experienced to one degree or another. Lord, it hurts to see how broken sin has wrecked your creation, wrecked your people, wrecked humanity. But we're thankful, Lord, that we can look forward to the day of the resurrection when you will make all things new, where you will restore things to the way that they were meant to be, where you will resurrect us from the dead to be with you forever and ever and ever, to love and worship you and cling to you all the days of our life. We thank you and we pray that this reality would be impressed upon our hearts, not just today because it's Resurrection Sunday, but every day that we live, may we live in light of the resurrection, that we have hope coming for us. We don't have to feel like we got to get everything now. We got to, we got to live for the glory now. We got to make sure that we see all the things now. No, Lord, we have it all coming for us. And so, Lord, may we be able to live as Christ lived, sacrificially, loving his neighbor as himself, declaring the gospel news. Lord, may our lives be a testimony to the greatness of Jesus Christ with our words, our actions, testifying to the fact that Jesus lives every day of our lives. May that be our hope. May that be our goal. May that be our purpose. And may that bring praise and honor to you now and forevermore, we pray. And so we thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for a Sunday like this where we get to remember it and we rejoice in it. We sing hallelujah and we declare the Lamb has overcome. Thank you, Jesus, that we are no longer in our sins. There is no condemnation for those anymore for, that are in Jesus Christ. We came here not under your wrath, not you pointing the finger at what you're going to condemn us for. We came under your grace as your sons, as your daughters, as brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ himself. And so thank you for the glorious reality that we get to live in. May we continue to live in light of this. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen. One more time. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, amen, amen.